All right, folks, welcome back. This is an extra lesson, but we'll call it episode 13 nonetheless. So last night, I gave a lesson on market structure for precision technicians and advanced price action theory. In action is going to be this lesson here. So it's one thing to talk about it and provide the basis as to what I'm doing when I'm doing these executions. When I'm running these demo accounts up really fast, you know, what am I doing? How am I doing it? I got a lot of questions as to how I ran the $10,000 account up to, which was at $256,000 this morning. But it quickly got to a point where it no longer can be appreciated from students' perspective. It's too fast of growth, and the acceleration just makes it, well, you have no you have no connection to it. If you don't know how to do this and you're new, and you start seeing velocity in equity increasing, even though it's a demo, it does not matter. The same principles are applied, whether you're trading with a live account or if you're trading with a demo account and you're learning. But I want to take you into what it is I do and how I'm able to run the equity up quick what is the mindset behind what is I'm doing? But before I get into it, let me remind you what I stated last night in the video. Because of the heightened volatility, because of the uncertainty and the likelihood of price action moves that would be unexpected even for me, because it's already delivered what I wanted to see happen anyway, and I'm technically bearish on equities. I don't feel confident or willing to risk after being profitable in live trading, going short this market, making my February gain. I don't want to go in and risk that because it's already arrived down below these lows. So there's an objective I look for for the week. There's an objective I try to aim for for the day. And there's something I'm aiming for for a goal for the month. So truth be told, the account that I'm showing with TD Ameritrade, I'm trying to illustrate in my best ability to pantomime how it would likely be for a new student if they were to try to do live trading with a model and aiming for 20% per month. Now, some of you are going to think, well, 20% isn't a lot of money. You know, it's not a lot of money. Well, 20% isn't money. <laughs> okay, It's a percentage. So I don't care if you start with $1. If you make 20% consistently, the compounding effects of that is astonishing. Now, is it my belief that my students can consistently hit 20% every single month? I would never go out on a limb and say that. I might not hit 20% one of the months. But that is a goal that I'm aiming for. And if you're a new developing student that have worked very hard to find and refine your own model with the things I'm teaching, and you have a trading plan that is well documented, you know what it is you're doing when you're not going to do something, you have a complete understanding of what it is that's going to allow you to engage or not engage in price, then how to manage that risk all those factors involved, and you've been consistent with a demo account for six months. Then and only then would I, not necessarily that you need to do this, but I would then only at that time consider maybe going into live fund trading. But I don't ever tell my students. I never answer an email when they say, do you think I'm ready to go into live? I don't answer those questions. I say, I don't know, you tell me. Or generally, I ignore those emails because there is never going to be a record of me saying, I think you're ready to go into live fund trading. And then when they blow their account, who are they going to blame? Naturally, the human is going to say, well, it wasn't my fault. It was a guy that told me I should do it. He told me to jump off the bridge. <laughs> so I never put myself in that situation. Okay, And I don't think any mentor or educator worth their salt would ever tell you to go out and risk life money. Because 
experience has taught me that I got into live trading way too fast. Way, way too fast. In 1992, that was the worst thing I could have done for my development was rush to get into to real money trading when I had no idea what I was doing. I tricked myself into believing it was so easy reading one book, no real back testing whatsoever. And I was like, well, you know, I can, I can see this one, two, three top and one, two, three bottom idea. I can see it. Yeah, I saw it. One, two, three. And I was gone <laughs> in my first trade, 50% history. Goodbye. <laughs> Close the account. Send me my money. I'm, I was afraid. But when we understand what it is we're trying to do, obviously, you know, it comes with a great deal of nervousness and anxiety because you have not put the time into back testing and then forward testing it with a demo account. So if you feel this tug of war, this butterfly feeling in your stomach where you just you can't relax and you're engaging in the marketplace, you're not ready. And that's the bottom line. You're not ready. You have to desensitize yourself with the results not being a factor. If you lose, it doesn't make a difference to you. You're indifferent to it. And it doesn't seem possible that you could be indifferent to losing money. But a student that has a solid price action model, a trade plan that's well documented, they know what they're going to do, why they're doing it, what they're waiting for, what will cause them to push the button to get in, where their stop loss is going to be, how much they're going to risk, what they're going to aim for, where their partials are going to be, if they're going to take partials at all. You have to know those things in advance. You can't determine them once you enter the marketplace. And that's what retail traders do. That's exactly what I did in 1992. I got into a trade, and then I tried to figure out what I was supposed to do once I was there. I want you to see what it is that I was showing last night. And even though I'm not personally willing to risk my live account right now because of the conditions that we have at the present, Ukraine and all that business, all the uncertainties, you know, potential black swan event, any time can pop off. And I don't want to expose myself to that measure of risk, especially since I have hit all my numbers. The market has delivered to what I expected in my analysis. So I'm not worrying about trying to get in and do anything else. So how do I manage that desire to get back in and do some more? I go right to a demo account. I work inside of a paper account. It provides me context. It keeps me glued, obviously, to what the market's doing. So I'm staying plugged in, if you will, close to the market, being able to read the tape. So that way I can answer student questions. I can still teach around what the market's doing right now. And that way my students can still appreciate the level of depth that I'm providing. But I'm not taking on monetary risk when I don't believe it's wise for me to do so. Because if I'm wrong, let's say I'm wrong. And I traded today with live funds or if I traded on Monday and I lose what I gained in February, that would eat at me all through the month of March. So it's toxic thinking. And I learned that the hard way many years ago. So what I'm going to show you, obviously, was executions in the TradingView paper trading account. But I want to make sure you understand because it's so many people out there that have this issue with me teaching in a demo, which is compliance. Like I'm not licensed to give you trade advice. So I operate through the function of a demo account to protect me and protect you. You know you can't make that money. You're not following me in a trade. So if I was wrong, you don't take a financial loss. And if I'm right, you can't make money and get tricked into thinking that the only way you're going to make money is to follow me. So there's a balancing that's being done there. And if I'm wrong, if I don't know what I'm doing and if these things don't work, they'll fail in the demo account just as easily they would be failing in the live account. So with that foundation laid, let's go into the discussion. So idea is we went below this low. I don't want to sell it short, even though I'm bearish. So what's it likely to reach up into? Well, I'm thinking it could potentially trade up into this up close candle here. Okay, I'm thinking it could trade into that, the low or the open of that candle. So that's kind of like the magnet or the draw on liquidity. So it also 
could reach up into this little area right here because there's a fair value gap there. Just like we had it here and here and filled in, it can go right up into this, go right up there, and then still resume going lower. It might need to go up into that. So I went in this morning and I was watching the NASDAQ and the e mini S&P. e mini S&P had a lot of energy to the upside. And usually these markets move in tandem. That means they're generally moving together. And even though that NASDAQ was a little bit lethargic and wasn't trying to go up as quick and as fast as ES or e mini S&P, the tendency is that it will be drawn to the same degree that the other indices were. So if ES was higher, NQ, which is NASDAQ futures, should be you know, brought higher in sympathy. All boats rise in high tide, basically is what I'm saying. Now, if we look at the hourly chart, this is what I was seeing. I was trading all this in a demo account, and it ran up into levels that it, it, it became absurd now. So I satisfy my itch when I'm not trying to trade with the live account in the demo account, and I'll run them up real quick. There is no fraud required, and none of those things are required to, to make these things compound and, and blow up really quick in terms of the equity increases. But I'm going to show you how, even with a micro account. So, if you haven't already noticed, this is the micro e-mini NASDAQ. So, every one point or four ticks is equivalent to $2. Okay? And I went in with the idea that I'm using a micro account with a discount broker. And the discount broker I'm hypothetically using while I'm taking these executions is I'm hypothetically trading with an AMP, AMP futures account. And I'll show you their margins and show you the details as to what I'm basically implying by doing these things here. Down close candle. After a run up, we retraced, went down inside this gap. See that? This area here, when it trades down towards this gap, this is the draw on liquidity up here as well, near term. So above these relative equal highs, we have what? Buy stops or buy side liquidity. So I'm thinking that the algorithm is not letting price go lower. So it's going after everyone that's been profitable going short. So where are their stops? Right over here. So we're just going to call it 14,110. Okay, real simple. So the market starts to rally and leaves this down closed candle. I'm going to watch to see if it can trade back down into that because if it does, I'm going to treat that as a bullish order block. Remember what I taught last night? If the move has been bullish, down closed candles should not be violated. Down closed candles should not be violated. They're going to act as support. Bearish market moves, up close candles should not be breached and broken through. Never even come back to that one. So when you're bearish and you're watching the market go down and you see candles starting to form a potential up close candle, you as a neophyte that is new to trading, these are the moments where you get scared and you basically snap yourself out of the desire to hold the trade and you just collapse the trade because you can't handle it. It's that overwhelming uncertainty that eats at you like mental cancer. It just literally makes you want to just get out of the trade, even when you're profit. You ever feel that? The trade's profitable and you're like, I just can't stand it anymore. I got to get out. You're making money. Your trade is profitable, quote unquote, in a demo. It's worse when you have live account funds and you have a profit. Because if you don't have the wherewithal and the experience of submitting to these ideas and watching them come to fruition over and over again, months of experience, not just a week or a day, you're going to feel like you just want to collapse the trade. 
So when I teach my students, when you're looking for a price move, it's going to be a long-term price swing. Not that this is a long-term price swing in the sense of time, but on this time frame for one hour, this is a nice decline. It's a prolonged price swing. It's not like little tiny little movements in here. And vice versa, we have it here. It's on higher. So all the down close candles, does it go below this down close candle when it starts to retrace? No. We expect this to be areas where they're going to accumulate more long positions. We retrace, going down into an imbalance, and then the market rallies above the down close candle. Does it support price? Yes. Time of day is important. So I'm watching when price comes back down into it here. I'm taking the opening price, extending it out in time. When that occurs, then I know I have a setup where I can go long. But I want to go into the time frames that are lower than the hourly chart to give me a little bit more context. Because we do have a low that has a higher low to the left and a higher low to the right. So that makes this what? Intermediate term low. This retracement here, this might be trading into an imbalance, which is what I'm teaching you to look for. But the overall market structure is it's likely to go higher and aim for a run above these highs. Buy side liquidity resting right up there. So we're going to take these levels. This red level is anchored to this here. Relative equal highs. Buy stops are above that. Rallies comes back down in. We're looking to see if it wants to run through that. Notice this high and this high. It creates what? Relative equal highs. Retail minded traders are going to see that and say, oh, this is exactly what the textbooks say about resistance. So it's acting as a ceiling. Price acting like a ceiling. What should they expect to see price do? Go lower. So here's that level where the buy stops are, or above it rather. Here's that hourly down close candle, which is a bullish order block. Notice the down close candle is made up of two candles on the 15 minute time frame. Price moves away from it, goes above it right here. Does it create an imbalance here? Yes. That is how you determine your high probability bullish order block. It must have the imbalance coupled with the down close candle and the underlying narrative that it's likely to go higher to reach for buy side liquidity. Period. Okay, it's it, it's that's it. There is no engulfing candle does this. Forget all that. You don't need that. Okay, it's the gap plus the down close candle plus the idea that it's likely to go up for buy side liquidity. That's it. Okay, so I just noticed, by the way, there's a guy out there, China Haka, seven dollar indicator, and he says he's the real deal. <laughs> And it's all about order blocks. And uh, I'm not going to change the name on that. Just to let you know. So we're trading down into this imbalance here. But now we're doing it at the time of day after the equities open at 9.30 in the morning New York time. So volatility. The initial move is te technically the incorrect move going into the opening at 9.30. So this is like a Judas swing. So think about what we're seeing here now. The market's likely to go up above this level here to take the buy side because the market's unwilling to go lower. The algorithm keeps pressing higher, 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 higher. It retraces down into the 930 opening. This is that fake move. Don't chase this and don't chase going higher right before the equities opening at 930 either. So you have to take a step back and figure out what is you're looking for. Well, I'm looking for a discount market. Low to high. I'm below 50%. Yes. I'm inside the order block. Yes. The equities opening has happened. I'm bullish and it has traded lower. So public is going to be thinking what? It's resistance. It's going to keep going down. To what? There's your support level because it bounced there last time. So they're going to think there. Well, it doesn't do that. 
down to a five minute chart. It hits the order block and then rallies. What is this? What's your favorite egg gap? Market trades back down and overlaps that gap between this candle's high and this candle's low. This right here, that right there, that is one order block with a lower time frame order block and a fair value gap. You can take that trade if you know what you're looking for and you understand bias, narrative, and where the liquidity matrix is likely to lead to later on, which is drawing up above this red level here. Uh, stops are above here. So if they're going to send the price higher from here and start rallying, that supposes that there's someone that got on board long here. Where would their ideal exit be? Six points higher? Ten points higher? No. They're going to want to take it up here where there's willing buyers with buy stops to protect their short positions. So when the market trades above that level, the buy stops become market orders to buy the market, which floods the market with liquidity. For those that have bought down here, they can sell to those willing buyers at a higher price, which they're waiting for down here and waiting for that price rally to go up. Now, as the market goes higher, the expectation is, and my expectation was, I want to go long in here and reach for this high. This was my entry idea that it's overlapping, filling in that gap, and it's an order block here with a higher time frame order block there. So there's an hierarchy, higher time frame to a lower time frame with the idea framed on it's going higher for buy side. I have an intermediate term low forming, and now this, when it fills in that gap, once that happens, what did I teach you last night? This becomes an intermediate term low. This low should not be taken out. Once it starts rallying, it should not come back down here. What else did I teach you? If price is going higher, down closed candles should support price. Well, it trades above it here. This down closed candle is high right there. It trades above it on this candle right there and starts going higher. But then look what happens. It starts to go back down. <gasps> it might go down here and stop me up. I'm not thinking that. I'm looking at this down closed candle thinking, it's only going right back down into this down close candle to accumulate more long positions. So smart money traders are going to be buying more here, like I did. Rallied. We have down close candles. We went above it. I'm not worrying about the market as long as it doesn't take out these two down close candles. Trades down, gets real close to that, but does it eat up and go through? That range of these two down close candles. No, it just retraces down into what? An imbalance. Why? So smart money can buy again. Like I did. The market rallies again and goes into the buy side liquidity. Order block. Trades through it here. Get long. Fair value gap. Order block. Retracement. Get long. Order block, imbalance with the fair value gap, trades back down, doesn't even come back down into the order block. This is classic. It generally doesn't like to go all the way back in and rebalance when it's that close to the profit objective. So the algorithm only has a small little retracement inside the fair value gap. So you would be a buyer just at that candle's low. And it runs right to the target. Now, I know some of you. Just don't trust me. These are TradingView execution errors, and I'm going to log in to TradingView and actually show you by highlighting these actual arrows. But I'm going to take you down into the charts. Now, all the, all the way down into a 30 second chart. So you can see the grouping of where I actually entered with this logic. Okay. Now, remember, intermediate term low is down here. This should never be overtaken until the objective is reached. So all of this price action leg here is I trust that it's going to keep going higher as long as the down closed candles keep price above it. Above what? Above the down closed candles. That's going to be supporting each new leg higher. The market should not retrace back down below those. So what am I saying? For trailing stop losses, you do not want to take 
your stop loss, if say you bought it down here like I did, and your stop was below the middle of this candle. That's mean threshold of the bullish order block. So I don't think it's going to go down below that once I'm entering. Then it starts to rally and goes above this candle's high. My stop loss must remain below this candle's low because it can dig into that candle because it's going to act as an order block. Then the market rallies away, comes back down, retraces. Now, if I put my stop loss inside this area here, I'm stopped out prematurely. The chances are you probably wouldn't have the wherewithal to get back in. You'd think, well, I just lost out on potential profit. I made a little gain, but I'm afraid to get back in now because it took me out. That's infancy. That's because you don't know what you're doing. Everybody was like that. I was like that. But you grow out of it. If you do the same things I'm teaching you over time, it's built into your understanding and it's ingrained in your understanding about price delivery. The market rallies above, takes out these two down close candles. Now the stock can be raised from whatever would be below this down close candle. Now it can be raised below this down close candle. Because the idea is the down close candles are one order block that should not be violated if it's bullish. If it comes down and breaks the low of these down close candles, well, there you go. You probably did the right thing by getting stopped down because it might be failing and going lower. How's that for logic? You're not going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. Even though you see these arrows on the lowest candle here and it goes out to the exit here, right above that, this is not photoshopped. I've never had to do a photoshop. Okay, I've never had to do that. But I'm teaching you the logic right out of last night's lesson. I went right into the market this morning. No, it's not done with a live account. But I'm showing you in theory with the application of a demo account, which is the same live data that would be utilized in my TD Ameritrade account or your live account if you have one. These candles are forming just like they would be in your live account. But I'm executing with the logic I'm teaching you right out of last night's lesson. Now, here is the one minute chart. All right, so here we're over in Trading View. Everything is live printing right now. This is where we're at at the moment. This is hanging around that old high. Now, I'm not upset that I missed this move here. I could care less. I'm going for the logical places where liquidity is going to be resting. And I'm entering in logical places that would reasonably expect to see price advance higher from where I'm buying. It's not complicated. But watching last night's lesson can feel like you're trying to learn a foreign language and expected to understand how to speak it fluently two hours later. Don't let that happen. Okay, I can make these lessons as deep as I want them to be, but I'm showing you how I'm taking very complex topics and simplifying them in a manner that hopefully is easily received by you as a student. So I showed you the hard perspective last night. That's advanced market structure. Now I've simplified it within the scope of what I teach in this YouTube channel. Do you see the difference? It's only in the manner of how I'm teaching it, but it's the same things. It's the same ideas that I've just simply made it easier. I've created a language that helps me communicate what I taught last night in a much more palatable method. So that way it's not as complicated seeing it like this. This makes sense to you all. You're like, oh, okay, now we're back into the stuff that makes sense now. I'm teaching you the same thing I taught you last night. I'm just not teaching it to you at the degree that is in my head. You might be thinking, well, you know, keep it to yourself. I see, see, I don't need to see it like that. And that's okay. I get it. It's fine. But this right here, these are the elements that make up really simple, logical setups that repeat every single week and many times every day. So I started, I ran up the other paper trading account to like 200 some thousand dollars this morning. And 
I was thinking to myself, okay, now we're in territories. It, it's just going to feel silly. You're not going to have any interest in seeing that. It's it, it, at that point, it becomes okay. Now we're absurd. It's just ridiculous. You're not going to believe that this is possible, or maybe some of you do, and you think you want to go out there and try to do the same thing with your live account. Either one of those things are not my goal. Okay, it's just me losing myself in price action. So. I treat it like a game. It's a puzzle. So I'm looking for the outcome of a specific trading session or a trading day, and I'm trying to navigate those candlesticks, and that's what you're seeing here. If I hover over top of these little arrows, okay, you can see that they're not photoshopped. And you make them appear by going into the trading view settings and you click the little execution box here. Watch below the swing lows and above that swing high. You'll see them toggle on and off, toggle on and off. Okay. So this is proving precision, number one. It's proving theory in action. And it's proving that it's not flawed logic. None of this is retail, absolutely none of it. There's nothing here that's Elliott Wave. None of it's harmonic. None of it is supply and demand. None of this is Chris Laurie stuff. I have a lot of Chris Laurie students, lots of them. And they'll tell you this isn't even taught in his stuff either. So with that said, let's go over to the paper trading account. This is just to, again, illustrate for the folks that say, well, you know, you can't really grow an account if you're using micro accounts and that was some of the comments I got also and I'm like stop thinking you need a lot to make a lot you don't you need to be able to compound the things that you see me do in these accounts and they're being parlayed up really quick every time I'm buying like I bought right here let me see if I can get this to go away for a second when I bought the three micros here the next time I see a buy signal that's below the area I'm aiming for, above that red level, I'm going to try to buy more. But I'm not going to buy more than three. I'm going to buy now two. I'm pyramiding. I'm building the biggest position initially. And then every time I buy in, again, I'm building it with a smaller position than I had prior to the one I'm entering now. Because I have all the equity behind that entry with three supporting the two I'm buying here. So even if it starts to re, you know, retrace too deep on me, I have the ability to weather a little bit more. Whereas if I say I want to be a buyer of one here, two here, three here, that's an inverted pyramid. It's not stable. Imagine a pyramid upside down and it's balancing on its point. It's, it's, not, it's not a solid foundation. It's wobbly. So I'm building the biggest base at the bottom of the pyramid or position size it's initial position entry. So I'm buying three here. Then I'm buying two here. Then I'm buying one here. And then I'm letting it run to my profit objective. Okay. With that said, starting with a hypothetical $10,000 account, just this morning, over 21%, one trade with three scale ends. Okay. I consider this all one trade. I don't consider this three separate trades. It's one trade scaled in. Largest, middle, last portion. Then it runs to my objective. So the account history starts with $10,000 here, ends with $12,111 demo money. Okay. The history tab shows you here, and if I'm not mistaken, I have everything shown, don't I? Yeah, time, everything's toggled here. Nothing's hidden, none of that. And then you can see over here, all the business there. Okay, so my question to you is this. Who cares if you got to trade a micro account? Three micros, two more micros, one more micro. That's six micro contracts. That requires technically $1,200. So 
So I really didn't need the $10,000 to do these trades, but in my mind, with proper leverage and money management, $10,000 with this position size and gearing, that's optimal. Anything more than this would have been too much leverage for that account. And to make 21% plus in one trade, who's going to argue against that being, well, above average? Now, what happens if you do that once a week? And that's your trade. And you stop. And once you hit it, you end your trading, that's it. And then you go to a demo account. Do you have any idea the leaps and bounds that you can have <laughs> in your equity increasing and the peace of mind knowing that you don't have to overtrade? That's what I'm trying to cultivate here in this community, folks. I'm not trying to create monsters that day trade every single day. Because I say these likely form every single day, but they absolutely form every single week, that is not an invitation for you to go out and say, ICT said trade every day. No, it's not what I said. I'm saying if you miss a trade, you're likely to find one tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow because it's Saturday, but you know what I mean, the, the next trading day. So there's a balancing act that you have to have when you're listening to me. You just can't take one comment that I say and take it completely out of context and say, well, ICT is a day trader and he's proven that he's really precise. And these concepts work. I watched a couple videos. I trust it. So now I'm going to go out and look in the charts and I think I see it forming right now and I'm going in all in. I'm in it. And then you're sitting down writing an email to me saying, I believe my account. Whose fault is that? It's not mine. It's yours. When I blew my accounts, it wasn't my broker's fault. It was mine. I did not know what I was doing. I was out of control, taking 60, 70 trades in a day. Mm -hmm. When you lose control and you have no idea what you're doing, it's impossible for you to execute like this. You have to think about these examples as the goal. Not that you want to be this precise right from the beginning, because you can't be. No one is. It takes time to grow into that in your understanding. But it takes some measure of goal setting that you have to have. You know, you listen to some people out there, they pretend to be teachers, they'll say, having a weekly goal or a daily goal is the stupidest thing in the world. Really? I guarantee you these people are not profitable that say that. They're hit and miss. They have periods of drawdown that are much longer than most people would be willing to endure. And if you don't aim for a target, you're going to hit nothing 100% of the time. You have to have a goal. So if your goal is to hit nothing, then obviously don't set a goal. But I set very low-hanging objectives in front of me. These things are extremely easy for my capability and for many of my students from the 2016 group and 2017 group. They can take trades like this. In fact, I have a woman in my group from the first group from Australia that is phenomenal. She does very, very well. And these are trades that I believe that even you as a YouTube student in this mentorship on my YouTube channel, I believe in six months of practice and looking at price action, you can do this yourself and do it consistently. Consistently. What do you mean? Every day, Michael? No. One time a week finding something like this and working that position in like that. Absolutely. I'm making myself available twice a week. And this is an extra video today because I know last night's video was a little bit more deeper than you're accustomed to. And I'm not suggesting or implying that the lessons are going to go that direction. I'm just stating that when I'm studying market structure, I'm studying it with that degree and more. But I had to create a language that gets to generally the basis of what that is doing without all the complications within it. So be glad that I'm not requiring you to understand that degree. Because the language I'm teaching, like in here, is accomplishing the same method. Just doing it without all of the extra 
acrobatics. Because I know what you're going to be questioning. You're probably looking at your chart thinking, how do I classify this swing high? Is it a medium term high versus a short term high and a long term high? How does he know? Right. That's the part you're never going to get. So I had to create a language that makes it simple. And that's what you see in my lessons on this YouTube channel. I showed by comparing and contrasting where I came from and what I'm providing to the public. I can show you just how complicated the real intricacies are behind these marketplaces. But you do need to know certain things that repeat, and they're very generic in price, and are not linked or built upon the foundation of anything that's retail logic. None of that stuff. Not support resistance, not any of those other disciplines that people use and you know, make businesses around selling books and courses and such. So, one of the cool things that if you still are a trader that uses like Elliott Wave and harmonics and things like that, if you start studying what I'm teaching you for free right here, you're going to find that your trades that win have my information underneath. And when your trades fail, the things I'm teaching you here are missing. See, this is what I asked last night in the closing of the video, and I'm closing this video now again. The mystery that plagues all speculators is what trading approach is the one that's going to make me money, and I don't have to worry about losing more money in flawed approaches of trading. What you're saying is there's a method out there that is better than everyone else. I'm humbly submitting to you. You have found it. It's not costing you anything. But it's going to require some work. It's going to require some time, effort. It's going to feel like you can't get it. It's going to feel like you're never going to understand it. That's all normal. It's all normal. But you'll get it. There's folks in my 2016 group that couldn't get it. They got it now. It took them a couple years. Others, they get it real quick. I don't understand why some get it quicker than others. I just know that it's like that. And you might be one of those slower learners. It's okay. I was a slow learner. But once you learn it, it's yours. You don't forget it. It's like riding a bike. And that should be your passion and your pursuit to get to know how to do this like riding a bike. You can put the bike down for a couple of years and then get back on it again and just like you never stop riding it. And that's a comfort and a confidence that is something that I can't articulate into words. And if you are able to find consistency and profitability... It doesn't matter what you're doing in the economies then. It doesn't matter how much it's going to cost you for a gallon of gas or how much it's going to cost you on your groceries because you can outpace inflation if you know what you're doing in these markets. That should be your goal. Always outpace inflation. And there should be no concern. I'm not promising you rich. Can you get wealthy with this? Sure you can. Am I promising it's going to happen for you? No way. Will you lose money in the process? Absolutely. I'm guaranteeing you're going to lose money. Every trading system, discipline, educator, everybody loses in trading. They take losses. Some take stunning losses. <laughs> Others just take mediocre losses that are just nuisance. Other traders that are really, really good can have periods of drawdown and then regain that equity drawdown back. And it's like it didn't even happen. Not even skip a beat. That's experience. These are all bridges that you're going to cross. You're going to cross them at times and intervals that I can't outline in advance for you, but I generally know the concerns and questions that you have at this point. My request to you is to suspend those feelings that you have to have all the answers right now. Because you don't. 
you have to be more diligent about placing yourself in front of the charts and back testing and researching what I'm showing you because it's there. And by seeing that over and over again, it's better than a book. It's better than a course. It's better than a mentorship that you pay because I'm teaching you how to go into price and price will teach you. It will teach you. It's repeating. So if it's repeating and you're looking at it constantly, you are training your eye to see what it does by default. When you buy a book and you look at the examples in the book, each chapter has an idea that it's trying to focus on. How many examples do you generally see? Just a handful at most, right? But remember what it was like when you got a trading book for the first time and you looked at it and you saw bearish divergence and bullish divergence with a stochastic indicator? And it made a lower low in price, but it didn't make a lower low in the stochastic, and that was a bullish divergence. And you were thinking, man, I can see that. That's easy. And then you started looking at it on a live chart, and when you thought it was diverging, it just kept going lower in price. <laughs> They're only going to show you the examples that help sell the book because they don't want you to return the book. I'm teaching you how to go through price action and ferret out these repeating signatures. And it isn't just a handful of examples. It's every week, every day, and it won't stop. So enjoy your weekend. I will touch base with you on Tuesday, Lord willing. And until then, be safe.